All right. Hello, Edmonton public. Um, I want to thank you so much for the questions that you had asked earlier. And I know that there were some questions that I didn't have time to go through. So I'm going to run through the top 10 questions that you had asked during my talk. So the first one was, how is AI changing the job market? And what should we consider when integrating it into our lives and schools? Uh, so I talked a little bit about the idea of the industrial revolution. So in the industrial revolution, we had 10 times the productivity. Uh, we like we needed to be 10 times or 100 times more productive than we had been in the past. And so really think about like the career, whatever career you're doing, as something that you're going to have to do as well. And when students ask me, hey, can I use ChatGPT for my homework? I say, absolutely, one condition. The condition is that you need to do 10 times as much homework and it must still all be correct because employers are going to know that you can use ChatGPT and they're going to have higher expectations for your work. Next question, uh, what are the main security and ethical issues with artificial intelligence and how can we make sure AI systems are used responsibly? Well, um, when it comes to security and ethics, um, unfortunately, there are many different frameworks. Like I think in the European Union, I think they have 120, more than 120 AI frameworks. And you can clearly see that those have not actually changed much behavior uh, from pretty much any social media company because they're all written by the tech companies to follow what they already do. And so really when it comes to security and ethics, um, that's up to you. And like I said, this is your responsibility to know what is right and wrong. Um, and I would say the main security and ethical issues with AI is that we're getting it to make moral decisions. Moral decisions about who should get that loan, who should be incarcerated and for how long, what kind of health care should be provided to that individual. These are all very ethical issues that we're making with AI that we shouldn't be making. So for us, it's about like fighting back and saying we don't allow, we won't allow AI systems to be used in that way. Next question is, in what ways can AI be used to improve personal finance management, game development, content creation uh, for platforms like YouTube? Haha, -ha, great question. So I think for all of those fields, Keep in mind, like we, we think of AI as this technology of the future, but think of it more like a technology that tries to reproduce a very specific version of the past. And so look at your own personal finance behavior and look at like which ones helped you the most. That can be something that the AI can do really well. Uh, for game development, I think a lot of like the core for game development is already in uh, Codex and other AI systems. So you can basically ask it to do things, which means that uh, if games are really easy to produce, uh, the way I described it is like when I went to school and I wanted to do like 3D development, I had to build everything from scratch. I had to write the engine and I had to call it all that stuff. And then later we have like amazing uh, engines like Unity or Unreal and I could just make amazing things. And so I'd say just think of it as uh, it's more easy so you can focus more on the content of what makes a good game rather than, oh, all this technical stuff. And then content creation on platforms like YouTube. Um, I think YouTube is still like one of the strongest platforms for uh, education. And I am hoping that there will be more people like yourselves who will speak to uh, the importance of AI ethics and the importance of that. But I do think, um, keep in mind that when you are creating for any platform, it doesn't matter if it's YouTube or TikTok, you are, yes, you're speaking to other people, but really you're speaking to an AI. And you have to understand like the AI is gonna be looking for things that make it more obvious. Like so big changes in scenery, bright images, louder sounds, like all of these things are very easy for a computer to assess. And so keep in mind, you are looking to um, speak to an AI as much as you are to the people. Before you even speak to a single person, uh, an AI has seen your video and reviewed it. Uh, the next is, can you explain how AI learns to communicate like humans and what goes into developing these technologies? That is a wonderful question. And I think that it's really about the data, right? So 
really what we do, and I love this example. Um, I do it with the, the young kids. It's like if I give you a sentence, um, you know, the cat, and then I put a blank, then you have to come up with the next word. That's kind of how we train AI systems. And we use a lot of data to figure out statistically what's the most, like what's the best answer. And so learning to communicate like humans is just copying and pasting the text of a lot of humans in a lot of training. And so when we talk about like what goes into developing and creating these technologies, the thing that is most important isn't the technology itself. It is the people who are like, there's an armies and armies of individuals who are going in, looking at all the data and coding it manually. This is what this is. This is what the answer should be. And that's where the real intelligence for AI comes from. And so when you see AI systems, don't think of it like, oh, there's some like magical technology. It is literally like the coding of people and people have been like writing like this is what the answer should be. That is where the real intelligence for AI comes from. How can the next question is how can humans and AI coexist, especially when AI lacks human values and machines can never truly understand or replicate these values. So this is where I see the, the most potential uh, for us is uh, in ethical AI being one where we try to put more and more moral decisions in the hands of people and we get AI to help so that we don't have to do as much prep work in order to know what's the right moral decision to make. Um, so for example, getting all the evidence together, that can be a lot of work, but like for ChatGPT, this is really easy to do. Like you guys have a few hundred questions. I tell ChatGPT, turn it into 10 top questions. It just does that like in an instant. And so we need to understand how the, the two can work. I think uh, the company Palantir did something similar because they're trying to identify fraud. And what they did was they uh, looked at all the different cases and they go, okay, like the AI can clearly determine these types of cases are fraud. And then these ones we're not so sure about. And it gets humans to do that part. And that's where a lot of the benefit comes from. And so there is a, a way, but it's about understanding what the AI can't do. And what are the things that it can't do, I think relates to some of the upcoming questions that you have. The next one was, what are some of the challenges of regulating AI? And how do AI regulations affect innovation and global competition? So I think that's a really great question. Um, when it comes to any sort of a regulation around AI, recognizing that AI is power. And the whole purpose of like, and when you are in power, the whole purpose of power is to stay in power. Right? That's like this to maintain the status quo. So this is one of the reasons why you have all of these big tech companies lobbying the governments and, and manipulating politics because they don't want to see that change. And so the challenge is that you're literally fighting against power. Um, and that's why regulating it has been so hard. And that's why all of these existing oh, AI ethical frameworks, they're all they're, they're not making any difference for behavior. Uh, and so, and how does it affect innovation and global competition? It is specifically designed to make it harder to compete, right? Because AI is a numbers game. So the people who have like all of the data, they're, they're the ones who are going to, to win. And it costs a lot of money to run an AI system. So it's less uh, democratic. But I'm hoping that that's a temporary thing because we are seeing open source versions uh, like Hugging Face where they will be very transparent about the data. What kinds of... Uh, content is in the data, what kind of mistakes it can make. So I hope that more and more open source models can be accessed, but they're always going to struggle against the commercial models um, produced by bigger companies because they got more money. Um, and so that's going to be a factor. Uh, so next question, do you think AI has the potential to both revolutionize our world and pose dangers? Um, and how can we balance innovation with safety? Um, and I would say, I don't think it has the potential. I think it already has revolutionized our world and it already is posing dangers today. Uh, if you look at our mental health crisis, if you look at like how polarized our society is today, all of this you can pretty much say is thanks to AI. Um, and so when we talk about balancing innovation and safety, 
we as a society have to come back and say, what kind of society do you want to live in? And uh, the thing that I will also emphasize is this is normal. Like, don't think of this as like a unique situation. Like, the two big exports of North America have always been um, capitalism and democracy. And capitalism always moves quicker. It always moves faster because that's what innovation is. It's like moving as quick as you can, breaking stuff. Um, and then democracy is like, it's, it's a little bit slower. It takes time. It takes time to catch up. So I do expect democracy to catch up, but it really, it doesn't happen by itself. It's, it does need you. So to balance innovation and safety, we as citizens, like digital citizens, must demand that safety be a part of it. We must require those types of changes and we must stop funding like, or, and stop sponsoring these big tech companies by paying for all this um, extra healthcare and mental health uh, that they call like problems that arise from what they caused. Next question is what opportunities does AI present for education and careers? And how can students prepare for a future in AI? So wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I see the, we did a AI session at the uh, computer users in uh, education conference in October uh, this year in California. And one thing people are saying is like, oh yeah, it helps with like creating lessons and everything. But understand that AI, like the current like chat GPT systems are incredible translators. They're, they're kind of like a, a, like a version of Google Translate on steroids. So it allows us to not only take ideas and concepts and then summarize them, make them easier to learn, but it also allows us to understand the context of other people better. So for example, if I took a story like Little Red Riding Hood and I asked ChatGPT, go and make me a story that would make sense for a, a student from Afghanistan, uh, we have an opportunity to do that. And it can help you see things from different perspectives, from their perspective. And then ultimately we can ask the question of, was this correct? Was this not? If you do have students in your class about it. And I see that as that's the opportunities that it presents. And when it comes to students preparing for a future in AI, um, I describe it as you need to know the secrets that I just shared, but you also need to understand just the basics that, you know, AI is just, it's just like power back in the day. And you need to understand that it's always trying to optimize for the benefit of its owner. And so really I ask like the students can best prepare by having a strong foundation, by having that anchor that I had shown earlier, knowing who they are as a person, what they stand for, what their passions are, that can make the biggest difference. Uh, the next question is, what do you think the future of AI looks like, uh, especially in terms of AI developing human-like thinking and affecting areas like co quantum computing? Those are really great questions. So. I find that most predictions about the future um, are usually pretty inaccurate. Like it's just based on what we know today. Uh, but I can talk a little bit, and this is where I said like AI is just trying to reproduce a version of the past, right? So which version of the past is it trying to reproduce? The one that is most profitable for those companies. And so just imagine that being extending, that extending. And you have to always ask like, what, what kind of like, whose agenda is it trying to advance? That is really the, the key that you'll need to understand. Now, in terms of um, human-like thinking, uh, <laughs> like from what we can understand right now about AI systems, it isn't quite like human-like thinking. Think of it more like we have these large language mod models that have the answers to like so many questions, right? And we just like, search and we find the, the right answer and we put it there. Is that the same thing as human-like thinking? I don't think so. Because I feel like in the end, we, yes, we take in a lot of data, but then we have all of these other elements that make us human. Uh, one of which is like, we die, right? We, we have a finite life. And that, that imminent death kind of makes us think about other people, makes us think about things like legacy. And so I think we're a long ways uh, from that. Even areas like uh, quantum computing, 
um, have the potential to solve some of the very hardest problems um, in terms of cryptography, uh, in terms of uh, even the, the training of some of these AI systems, like decision making, for example. But in the end, we still have to ask the question, like, do we want to put more and more decision making ability into the hands of AI? And so that's where I see the future is like there's going to be the push from corporations and then there's going to be the push from the few people who are aware of what AI really is like and how it's impacting people. And they're going to be butting heads. I don't know which one's going to win. But I'm really hoping that, you know, we as a society can come back and say, we don't want to live in this society where we all hate each other all the time. You need to change what you're doing. Um, could you give, pra the last question I have is, could you give practical advice on how to navigate online security and privacy in an AI driven world, including understanding terms like doxing? Um, so let's like first talk about doxing. So doxing is the the provision of personal information, like a person's address, uh, their gender, their email, like any personal information in a very public way. And it's a, a way to like shame or harm people. And if you think about this, this is not all that different. Doxing is not all that different from a privacy breach with companies. And you see this all the time is that data is always being leaked. It's always being hacked. Somebody always, and the limiting factor is often not the technology itself. It's the people, right? Like, oh, somebody uh, stored all your data in a non-encrypted form and somebody hacked it and they now they have all your credit cards and your phone numbers and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so really when it comes to practical advice, um, I think that it's not really possible to protect your own privacy. I think that this idea of like, oh yeah, I can keep information on the internet and it's somehow going to be safe forever is not true. Uh, I think it's more likely that it is going to get hacked. And so um, really the best thing that I've seen that you can do is just put false information, right? Like put uh, wrong birth dates put like wrong emails, wrong addresses, uh, put false information whenever you can so that you train the AI to, uh, to learn the false information because in the end, it's still gonna use it. And the other thing I'll also add is when I talk about generative AI uh, to students, one of the most important things is you must understand the terms and conditions uh, that you signed up for. When you post that image to Instagram, or you post that video to TikTok, are they allowed to use your image? Are they allowed to uh, use that as part of training for an AI system? Do you have the rights to your own content? If you're an artist and you start making a bunch of beautiful pictures and you start putting them on Instagram and then somebody starts using that to train an AI, you need some recourse in order to go back and you need to be able to ensure that my stuff is copyrighted or there's there you're not allowed to use it like you have to be able to know that you can specify that and that's where um a lot of the lawsuits are right now uh is all around like copyright who owns your data can your data be used to train an ai and that's what i'm seeing is most of the stuff that you post like it wouldn't be hard to to copy it and and to to make a copy of you and so this has happened for like uh some ceos they'll they'll they're their voice, which is like public, you know, and all these videos will be used as a deep fake. And somebody will call in, it will sound exactly like the CEO um, because it's a, a deep fake that's generated. And you need to know um, in, in this world of generative AI, whether or not your content, the stuff that you post online can uh, and will be used uh, as training for an AI system. Because that's what they did. They just went, scraped the web, found everything that they could, and then they use that to train the AI system. People didn't know that they had signed up for this, but seems like, especially when it comes to AI models, we're not even given that um, ability to say, no, you can't be a part of the data. Um, we, we're, there's no opt out. And so, and that is the last question that I have. Uh, I know you guys have a few more questions, but I wanted to cover just uh, the top 10 ones as quickly as possible. Thank you. I'm Dr. Ed um, with AI Parenting. You can just check out AIParenting.live if you want to learn a little bit more about what I do. Thank you, and I will see you in the next one.